Okay, come on. Hey, Alex. Yes. I am on my caucus call right now with the Democrats, so I will be muted probably for the first beginning part of your guys' meeting. Is that a problem? Do I need to have my video going? or? No, no, you're completely fine. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, if, as long as you're good to go by the Q&A, which would be about like 15 minutes in, like you're 15 to 20 minutes, like you're, you're good. Okay. I'm going to try and finish this one up as quickly as I can, and then I will definitely be available for a Q&A. So I will be here, but I'll be muted. Okay, no, sounds good. Thanks for the heads up. All right, thanks. So what was the what was going on? I was hearing it, but I was getting bits and pieces of it. Okay, no, we're good now. We're all we're all good. We're all settled. Okay. Okay. We're about to start. Um, we have fourteen attendees right now, so let's give it about like like what three more minutes? Yeah, yeah, we got three to five minutes, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah. Um, then we'll just yeah, we we'll get started. I'm going to say thank you all for uh, putting this together, making sure that it got done. Um, it's already awesome. <laughs> all right. And they're going to put their questions in the chat. Am I correct? Well, how are we doing that? Uh, well, we'll have a question and answer time. They can put it in part of the question and answer slot. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Yeah, thanks for everybody that's joining us right now. Um, everybody just jumped in. We're going to give a couple minutes. Uh, people are still uh, coming in. Uh, just a little bit of the agenda. We're going to do a quick introductions. We're going to go into the presentation itself. Um, and then we will open the floor for uh, a Q and A um, for whoever and, and however, but however many questions we might have. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we will be recording this, so this will this video will be made available for anybody that um, unfortunately couldn't make it um, or wants to review some of the things we said for note taking. Um, that will be made available. We do have uh, the ability to email all of you that information, so no worries. Hang tight. Um, everybody will have a copy of the presentation um, and the resolution itself. They'll be able to see that as well as access to a link to the video. So um, again, if you're not able to make it or you know you had to cut you have to cut out a little early, no worries, we'll take care of that for you, okay? Okay, I see some see some names already here that I know. Shout out to the homie Claire bus and you go son. Josiah, what's up? I see you. Okay, let's see if we can get Patricia Perez, okay. I see my wife in here too, okay. I see you. <laughs> Big Solomon, I see you, brother. How's it going? Stacy, I see. Uh, oh, I saw it. Hang on. All right, we'll start in two more minutes. We'll start at six thirty-five. Um, we will begin shortly. Okay.
All right, well, sorry, one more minute just to reiterate again, geez, if I could talk. Uh, again, this is being recorded. We will make the recording available. Um, if we, if I go a little too fast in the presentation, don't worry. Again, we will provide a copy of the presentation to everybody that is in attendance. So no, no, no need to trip. You guys will have access to all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and commence. Um, I want to start with introductions. My name, for anybody that doesn't know me, is Alexander Perez. I am one of the organizers, organizers with Equity and Transformation. Um, today we also do have Shawnee Williams. I will go ahead and let her introduce herself. And then uh, Rachel Ventura, um, who is the uh, Will County board member that's helping push the resolution, the proposed resolution, um, is with us, but she's going on another call. So she, you know, she's a busy woman. I'm here. I'm oh, here. Yeah, never mind. I think that I spoke too soon. So you I'm can gonna... unlock my video and I'll turn it on. Sorry, thanks. Oh, no, no, you're good. I will go ahead and, and let them introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Shawnee Williams. Um, I am a Will County resident, and I also work in the cannabis industry um, for a company called Illinois Equity Staffing. We focus on um, social equity, diversity, and inclusion from a human resources perspective. Um, and I am here just as a stakeholder and an industry um, stakeholder as well. Uh, and I know, Rachel, I'm trying to get you access to the camera, but if you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself beforehand, either way. Okay, sure. So I'm a Will County Board Member District 9, which encompasses uh, all of Crest Hill, some of Lockport, some of Joliet, a little bit of New Lenox, and a tiny bit of Plainfield. And I recently uh, introduced a resolution. Uh, it has yet to be heard officially on committee, but it has been heard in the Democratic Caucus. Uh, and that's the resolution I hope that we'll be looking at tonight. And I encourage everyone to contact their county board members and ask them uh, to support this resolution. And I'm sure we'll get into the nitty gritty as we continue on. Thank you. All right, we also have uh, Nicole Laporte with uh, Equity Transformation and Alonzo Wahid, one of an amazing organizer with uh, Equity Transformation as well. Um, we are all the ones that came together to put this presentation together because um, we really wanted to make sure that the community is informed of what we're trying to do and what this is and why it's so important. So having said that, I am going to jump right in to the presentation. joining us. really appreciate you taking the time out to be here with us tonight. Um, today we're going to talk about the Will County Cannabis Tax Resolution and what it is and why it's important. So first question off the bat, we already know people are going to ask, what is the Will County Cannabis Tax Re uh, Revenue Resolution? Um, quite frankly, it's a proposed resolution, um, as Rachel said, that aims to create a committee um, that will oversee the spending of incoming cannabis tax revenue. The idea is to help communities within Will County that were impacted by the war on drugs and mass incarceration. For me, I think context is key, so I always want to start at the beginning um, just to give a little information on how we got here and, and what's happened since then. So, um, in May of 2019, the CRTA, or the Cannabis Revenue and Tax Act, was passed. Um, and then January 1 of this year, 2020, recreational cannabis sales became legal. Um, leading, uh, paving the way to where we are now um, in the debate of, of how we should use cannabis tax revenue that's being generated for uh, various counties. So for all my Cardi B fans out there, the state of Illinois is making money. This is true. Um, and these little excerpts uh, from um, newspapers kind of just further that story. You know, Illinois is, is shattering um, revenue projections. They're making a lot of money. Now with that, so is Will County. So Will County is projected to make $109,000. Uh, sorry, excuse me. They project they made $109,000 in the first month of their marijuana tax revenue. Um, now, one of the important things that I wanted, to, I do want to note, is that the state of Illinois does provide um, um, money 
monthly to the to Will County, and that's actually six six three hundred dollars a month. Um, now, before anybody asks, well, what's the difference? The difference with between the hundred and nine and the six three hundred uh, monthly is that the six three hundred dollars comes from the state tax. Uh, now that money is is already earmarked for uh, things that uh, pertain to like public safety, policing, um, anti crime. So that money can't be spent. However, the, the county wants to. That has to be spent specifically for certain things. Yeah, and I'll jump in here. So the money to date on the state side of the dollars is about $54,000. Um, and although it does have very specific qualifications, that money right now goes into our corporate account, and it will have to be divvied out. So as long as it's going to those specific allocations, it, you know, it can be spent that way. The $109,000 that we got from June of 2019, that is the money um, that has yet to be allocated. But there's nothing saying that this, the resolution we're presenting here today can't dictate how both of those amounts are allocated, both the $109,000 or the $54,000 that we've taken to date up until September from the state dollars, other than that those $54,000 has very specific allocations to them. Thank you for that, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. So that kind of brings us to where we are now. So again, to reiterate, you know, what would the resolution do? Um, again, Rachel, feel free to jump in um, anytime. Um, it would create a board that would oversee the spending of the cannabis tax revenue only um, on the county level. So here's why you should support the resolution, why it's really important. Um, the state of Illinois created a map that outlines disproportionately impacted areas, or as we like to call them in the cannabis industry, DIAs. Uh, these, were, these zones were created uh, to highlight parts of the state that were impacted by the war on drugs and over-policing due to cannabis, among other ailments. So uh, I actually took a, a screenshot of the DIA map that's actually on DC, the DCO website. Um, and I specifically uh, took a screenshot of this area because if you notice, this actually outlines Will County. Now if you notice, again, the blue areas are DIAs. So Will County has a sizable chunk of area that qualifies as DIA. A lot of it pertains to Joliet, but there are outlying areas around Joliet. Um, Bolingbrook has a nice little chunk. Um, and I believe the city of Creek, where uh, Shawnee is from, uh, there's an area right here that's next to that on the east. And again, uh, to be designated as a disproportionately impacted area, a census tract must have high rates of the following. Arrests, convictions, incarcerations, um, related to cannabis, among other qualifying uh, qualifications, including poverty and unemployment. Now, what's the correlating factor is that these are areas that had seen uh, increases in over-policing in over and mass incarceration as a uh, result of the war on drugs. On top of that, uh, the state also created an R3 map. Now, if uh, you're not familiar with R3, what R3 is, R3 is a grant program that was created by the state of Illinois that comes directly from um, state cannabis uh, tax revenue. Now, before anybody asks, well, you know, why can't you know, we just use a grant to help support the, these communities? That's because this money is not guaranteed. Um, to, uh, to get some of this money, uh, an indi individual or an organization has to apply for the grant and has to win the grant um, in order to get some of that funding. But what the R3 map does do is it builds, it builds upon uh, the information that's already been provided um, in the DIA map. So that's why you see some of these arees that are do qualify as DIA, or I'm sorry, R3 areas. Um, noticeably, noticeably around the Creek area, you have a, a, an increase of, of more zones and there's an expansion uh, around the uh, Joliet area. Bolingbrook still stays the same, um, but these uh, areas are areas that have high rates of gun injury, unemployment, child poverty, and, and, and rest again. So I want to jump in here. If you kind of think of the tax dollars as going into buckets, you have the state dollars that are going to one bucket, and they have rules on that bucket. You have to spend the money based on those rules. Then you have a second bucket that's the county money, that's where we have yet to have any rules placed on that bucket. And then the third bucket is still state dollars, but it's for the R3 program. They can only be spent in these areas that are highlighted on the map, um, and they have to be applied for. So what we're hoping is that the committee that we create here can go after all three of those buckets and utilize the money to its, its greatest potential. That doesn't necessarily mean they use it all in the same area or advise using in the same area, but that they are their goal is to try to maximize that those dollars and use them in areas that we can get the most thing out of our buck. 
Um, it, it, obviously, if it's the R3 money they apply for, it has to be used in those areas, but that doesn't mean the county money necessarily has to, and then the state dollars, as, as long as they follow those rules. So there is multiple buckets here that they're pulling money from, and I know that makes it a little confusing, but I hope that helps simplify it. Thanks, Rachel. It definitely is a lot of information coming at everybody at once. But that's what the teaching is for, right? And I just want to add really quick. So for the R3, this is Shawnee. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if someone lives in the, in that red or pink area, that that's it. So if you work in that area or you go to school in that area or you live in that area, you technically are, according to R3, affected. Um, so you could live, say, in New Lenox, but actually go to school in Joliet, like go to, you know, Joliet Junior College or something like that. And technically, um, R3 is for that area, whether it's someone going to school in that area, going to work in that area, or living in that area. So just keep that in mind. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so why are these areas significant to Will County? Well, in Will County alone, there are 21 zones that qualify as R3 areas. Uh, out of those 21, there are six areas that qualify as high needs. I mean, they, they uh, meet a certain threshold uh, of suffering from those uh, ailments that I previously mentioned uh, at a higher rate. And doing a little bit of math, the United States Postal Service has a really cool tool that allows you to, to uh, see um, their routes based on uh, zip codes. And so you can actually get a breakdown of income, and population. And so utilizing that tool, um, I did a little digging and I found that there are approximately 9,000 Will County individual uh, residents that reside within those six high need areas alone. That doesn't take into consideration the other zones uh, that qualifies R3. So why is there significant? Again, part two, uh, the median household income in Illinois is around $64,000, right? Uh, well, a large number of the areas within the defined DIA zone and R3 zones in Will County hover around $35,000 or less for a household income. And that's significantly less than the median. So that's where we come to community investment. Um, literally, everybody wins. It's, it's a little big bucket of win for everybody. Um, and here's how it works. Injecting cannabis tax revenue into underserved communities can increase generational wealth, drive down crime, increase property value, halt gentrification, increase community retention, help close the wealth gap, and increase quality of area schools. And now this is where we come to you guys, the community, and everybody that's on this, uh, this call right now. Um, we look to you guys for help, right? So we are actively circulating a petition um, in support of the Will County Cannabis Tax Resolution. Again, we will provide everyone with a copy of this presentation, so there is a link that's embedded into the presentation, so you can actually click on the, the, uh, the petition and access the petition through that way. Um, we would love for you to join the coalition and join us in what we're trying to do. If you please feel free to email us at info at Chicago, uh, eatchicago.org. For any questions, concerns, or want some more information, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We will make sure to get back to you in a timely fashion. Um, the next thing you can do is obviously get informed. Uh, Again, there is a link here that will take you to the full resolution. Um, I will say that the resolution is not in its entirety. There's still things, some things that need to be vetted. Uh, Rachel, again, if you want to jump in. Um, but by and large, the, the resolution can be read in its, full, uh, in its full context. And we have the link here. Again, once we send this out, you'll be able to read that, uh, the, the full resolution for yourself. Um, and most importantly, we need you to share. Uh, download, share the video, talk to your friends and family. We will provide all these resources, again, for you to share. Um, it's going to take a community effort to get this passed. It will be an uphill battle, but we really feel that there is a, a, there's a real big need for this resolution to be passed. There's, we can have the opportunity to really bring some generational change um, and generational wealth into communities that have been underserved for a long, long time. Yeah, I'll jump out a little bit. I, I am encouraging people to sign the petition and to send it. Um, if you don't want to sign the petition, you can contact your county board members directly. The idea of this committee, uh, I mean, you can read the full resolution, but there's two parts of it. The first resolution, uh, the first part of it is the preamble where it talks about the history of how our laws here in Illinois have affected the black community specifically. Not to say other people were not affected, 
but some of these laws were intended very much to keep um, the black community uh, kept down. And so that is where we're talking about repairing the damage. More recently, those laws have been the war on drugs and redlining, but we've saw things all the way from, obviously, enslavement through the, the black coats, the Jim Crow era, um, and then, you know, moving into the war on drugs. And so the idea of the second part of the resolution is creating that committee. And I've suggested that we create a committee of nine black, black individuals. And that is why the preamble is on this resolution, is to show why the justification for an all-black committee. And the reality is that we've created the greatest wealth gap over three, four hundred years uh, of our black and African-American brothers and sisters because of the laws and policies that we have in, instilled. So in order to undo some of that damage, we need to start looking at um, shifting power, first and foremost. We didn't initially think that this was going to generate a lot of dollars, but after our first month of bringing in the county dollars of $109,000, it is looking like there's going to be more money than we had initially anticipated. Um, but the hope is that we use those dollars, um, as Alex had said, to shrink that wealth gap, which in turn helps everybody. Because if we all have better property values, you know, unfortunately, we're all paying higher property taxes. And so then the higher burden is not on people who have maybe a higher paying job or, or um, you know, one side or the other. Everybody's paying their fair share. But equally, that we don't have as many programs where people feel that they need to supplement their income. Um, these are typically called social programs. Uh, so, you know, people who tend to sway politically to the right feel like, oh, all of our tax dollars are going to social programs. Well, if we are instilling better opportunities for our, our communities, better job opportunities, better housing opportunities, then there's less social programs that need to be there. So, you know, in that capacity, we're spending less dollars there. We're instilling more dollars into empowering people to make their lives better and ultimately giving them more freedom. We want people to have the freedom to choose. We don't want people to feel like they have to choose a certain restaurant or choose a certain store because their dollars dictate it or because SNAP dictates oh, yeah. it or policy dictates it. We want people to feel that they have the freedom to choose. And that is what some of this is about, is closing that wealth gap and making sure that the people who have been affected by these laws uh, in the past have the voice and power to change that to empower their communities so that everybody ends up being um, equal. I mean, to me, this is a step in equality. Um, and we can't do that if we ignore our past um, history and if we ignore the problems. And that is not to say that other people have not been affected. And those are things that I hope the county board will have a healthy discussion of. But the truth of it is we won't have any discussion if they feel they can cite set this and pass some other resolution on how to spend these dollars. That is when your voice, the community voice, is so important. So you have to get out there and send either file it, uh, send your name to the petition, send this to your friends and family, send an email to the county board, pick up the phone and call them. Because if they feel that this is not important to you, I guarantee that this will not be important to them, the representative. So I can't encourage you enough to, to spread this message. Um, and the reality is we have a moment right now, a unique moment in history, to change the trajectory that this country is on. There is one other city that has passed this, and that's Evanston. And they, committed, uh, they created a committee of um, their own board members, elected board members. What I'm suggesting we do is take one step further from what Evanston has done and create a committee of our community to, to uh, how to spend this money um, and that this can be duplicated then across this country. So while Evanston might have been the first city, Will County can be the first county, but the hope is that we are not the, the last state or last county or last city to pass this and that really the sense ripples across this country. So if you want to be a part of the change that is happening in America today, this is our moment. This is the time to get involved, and I look forward to working with everyone who is excited as I am. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was, that was beautifully said. Um, and before we do open the floor to questions and answers, I do want to highlight the fact that um, we do have uh, a large group of individuals that represent our religious communities. Um, by and large, especially as minorities, especially black and brown folk, we know that uh, in our religious communities, cannabis, um, you know, it's been demonized. And, and, you know, but that's not a conversation that we're looking to have right now. We're not advocating for the usage of cannabis. What we are advocating for is the responsible spending of those cannabis tax dollars, just as Rachel highlighted. Um, you know, this cannabis tax 
revenue is a privilege um, that the state of Illinois had, uh, enjoys, but that comes off the backs of black and brown individuals who um, are incarcerated or who are no longer with us, unfortunately, due to, to, to cannabis-related violence of some sort. And so we really want to make sure that we are investing in the communities that have given the state of Illinois and, quite frankly, Will County the privilege to utilize this cannabis tax revenue. And so with that, I will go ahead and open the floor to a Q&A if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, uh, Shawnee, Rachel, or myself. It looks like someone's asking for, yeah. for the, the actual res resolution. Yes, again, uh, to reiterate, we will be sending emails to everybody that um, is on this call with us. So you will have access to the presentation, um, we will follow up with the video, um, and then you will have access to the, uh, to the document that contains the resolution itself in language. And then we have Alexandria. Um, she's asking, can you speak to how the people that will serve on this oversight board will be chosen? Yeah, I can speak to that. So the resolution uh, appoints these individuals. So the way that the county board currently appoints is that the county executive chooses a name um, and then the county board approves that name, uh, confirms it. It's not unlike, we have a executive form of government here in Will County, so it's not unlike uh, how our president and the Congress then confirms when they do like judge um, ships, for example. So I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, about is there a chance for them to be elected from being appointed. Um, in order to be elected, we have to go through the state process. And so this, to me, this resolution is the first step. I don't anticipate that this resolution will be perfect. I think we will learn a lot. I will be interested in, in hearing more on how we can move forward if, this, if the appointment doesn't seem to be working as well. But this, again, gives you an opportunity to contact your county board member and let them know, um, yes, you agree with the people who are being appointed, or no, you do not. Um, and so it, there isn't exactly public oversight, but the fact that we don't have a rain on money in our politics, you know, it does kind of sidestep the fact that anyone can buy their way to the top when it comes to elected positions, but I'm open for improvement. However, I think that this is the fastest way to get this resolution passed is to have these positions appointed. I see we already have a couple nominations. Yeah, and so all of those, so there'll be an, uh, when I, so there'll be an open process of applying. So our executive, any appointments for any position that the county board um, uh, approves and appoints has to be first be posted, and that's usually posted on our website. Um, however, they are posted different times of the year. So obviously, if this is approved, there, I'm sure there will be a lot of newspaper uh, stories about when those um, positions will be posted online. So people fill out a form saying why they're interested. There's kind of, it's not quite a resume, but there's you know some information about re uh, references and, and what you've done in the community and why you're interested in running for this position. Those are then, um, at some point, the executive looks through those and selects one, um, and then they present that name to the county board. Uh, we're giving that information you know a couple weeks out. It's added to our agenda, and then we vote on it. Um, that any time a county board member can ask to see all of the resumes and, and bring up questions if they have concerns about who they're appointing. So in this case, it's a board of nine that we've recommended. One of those board members, uh, one of those committee members need to be an elected board member of the county board. The other eight would then be selected at equal um, gender, so half women, half men. They would serve for two years. Um, there's a maximum in there that they cannot serve more than two consecutive terms um, or no more than I think it's six years if they were to take over someone else's term. So I hope that answers some of those questions. But again, all of these uh, points could be negotiated uh, before the resolution is approved. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, if you guys do have questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A so, Q so I can keep track of all of them as they come in. Um, so I do have a question. Um, how does county board member feel about how do county board members feel about the resolution? That's from uh, Levister Smith. I think that's a mixed bag, and this is why we're encouraging people to reach out directly and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, I think a lot of people have been hesitant to to say one way or the other whether they supported or what parts they've supported it. 
There's only been um, some discussion in the Democratic Caucus, which is a public meeting and is on record. You can listen to the recording by contacting Will County Board. I'm sorry, County Board at WillCountyIllinois.com. Um, they can get you that information. But other than that, uh, we had a small discussion on the legislative committee, also open to the public, but very few people spoke directly on whether they would be voting for this resolution or not. I do see another question about whether committee members need to slate a political affiliation. No, they do not. Um, this would be considered a nonpartisan board. Um, we do have another question from uh, Rex. I'm going to get to you in a second. Uh, uh, but we do have another question from Elizabeth. Uh, would greater consideration be given for individuals who have been directly um, impacted, such as returning citizens? I guess I need better clarification. Um, so this, is she saying for appointments to the board? I think we might need some clarification with the question okay. as well. Um, so as far as the resolution, yes. Yes. Other, the only thing that dictates in the in the resolution is that the committee would be made up of nine individuals. One individual would be a county board member, and the other eight individuals would be um, uh, equal sexes, gender, um, gender, male and females, and that all nine would be black or African descendants. So other than that, it would be up to the executive to choose. So I would encourage individuals to put that information on their um, application. However, I want to be very clear that this resolution has not passed. So one of the reasons for this meeting is to get the support needed to go to the county board and ask them to support this resolution so that we can create this committee. Um, I would hope that um, we would have people who have, were more directly impacted by the war on drugs um, or you know, descendants of slavery or people who have dealt with the redlining laws to be able to be a part of this committee so that they could have direct input on how best to spend these dollars. That is the intent of this resolution. However, if we don't get the support needed at the county board, we won't see this in the light of day. Good. Thank you for that, Rachel. And uh, Rex, I believe Shawnee did address your question um, in the in the chat box. If you want to check that out, thank you, Shawnee, for answering uh, Rex's question. Um, I do have uh, another question from Charlie Kim. What should I do if our representative in Aurora is not responding and not cooperating to answering my questions? What is the best me the best method to go uh, to get a response from my representative? Um, I'm always a fan of doing things publicly, so writing letters to the editor of your newspaper is always a great thing to do. Um, some people like to use social media, Twitter and Facebook to call those individuals out. I mean, I always think going to them directly uh, through an email or phone call is a good way to go, but if you feel that that representative is not responding, um, you may want to help get the community involved. That's kind of the idea of this petition, is if you feel that you, you don't want to take that on yourself, you don't have to. We can bring other people on to help you. Um, Alex, Nicole, and Alonzo here have all been very helpful. I'm sure Shawnee will, will get involved as well. So if there's areas, let's say you have an HOA or a PTA group or some other parenting group or um, maybe your church wants to, to host some information about this, that's where our resources can come in. We're more than happy. Any one of us are happy to come out speak to different individuals about what this resolution represents and get um, your group uh, the tools that they need to contact their county board member. So you feel that you don't you don't have to get the blow off, that other people getting involved, putting the pressure on the county board member, eventually they're going to have to answer. And at the end of the day, if they choose not to, we have elections every two years. I, am, I encourage you to get involved in those elections, uh, whether it's voting or if you're not happy with the names on the ballot, run yourself or encourage those who you feel are qualified to run for office. Um, I do have, a, we have more questions to form. I'm trying to get through these. Um, here's one that I knew I was waiting for. <laughs> uh, Robert, how do we respond to those, I'm sorry, excuse me. How do you respond to those who still consider this a form of reparations? Um, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna open the floor to all of us to talk. I will start with that. Um, listen, I mean, there have been, reparations have been paid to many communities. Um, reparations have been paid to the Japanese American community. Um, post World War II, for you know, their, um, you know, their, uh, they were sent into internment camps, and they were paid reparations. Um, reparations have been paid to communities, to minority communities in this country throughout our history. Um, you know, I just, for me, as a person of color, as an Afro Latino, I just don't understand when it comes to reparations to the black community. Um, you know, why it's, it's such a hot topic. Um, you know, call it what you want. Uh, what I want to highlight is the fact that this tax that the camp, the Will County, and again, the state of Illinois has the privilege. Of collecting comes from the uh, back 
backs of black and brown individuals. Um, black and brown individuals were incarcerated or, or, or subjects of violence um, in regards to cannabis at way higher rates than our white counterparts. And so, you know, because you were well, using we're it, you about, dummy. We're talking about equity. Um, these communities have afforded um, the state of Illinois to enjoy the tax revenue that they are enjoying right now. That hundred million dollars came from somewhere, um, right? And, and these communities that the state has outlined um, were victims of over policing as a result of the war on drugs and mass incarceration. Afford the state the ability to have this money to utilize however it sees fit. Um, so I think what we need to remember is that. There, this was paid for us by other individuals, and those individuals primarily looked black and brown. Um, so I really I want to make sure that people understand that um, that this is a greater conversation. It's about doing right by those communities that give us that this is possibly to spend this now. If anybody else wants to jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, I already kind of gave my piece at the county board meeting um, about this. A lot of people wrote emails, really nasty emails, um, regarding the subject of reparations. First of all, I'm not a fan of that word, especially in this case, um, for a lot of different reasons. But at the end of the day, Alex has already really pointed out um, the main points. When we look at the war on drugs, the people that were disproportionately affected, honestly, were black and brown folks. What we have now in these disproportionately impacted areas that Alex pointed out to on the map are actually, it's, it's a diverse um, area. So when you're looking at those areas, those areas that are red and blue and Joliet and Bolingbrook and whatnot, those areas um, don't just have black and brown people in them. Um, they actually have, believe it or not, some Caucasians in, in those areas. Um, but when you talk about those areas that have been impoverished, they've also been over policed um, and so the suggestion of creating a board to really be thoughtful about where this cannabis tax revenue is coming or going um, and being infused into the community to make sure it's for the greater good of the entire community and not certain parts of the community I think that's where um, this resolution really is trying to focus on um, I think folks that are focusing on the word of reparations when it's nowhere to be found in that resolution are folks that really need to to, to look at within themselves and look oh, at some possibly shit. some some um, let's just say racist uh, views. <laughs> and again, I mean, I think it's I, I I think it's it's common math here. You know, we see that people want their property values to increase, right? Because that that's a return on your investment. You bought that home, you want to sell that home at a greater price, right? That's your ROI. You're looking for a return on that investment, right? And now, if you are in an area that uh, is being affected by lower uh, property, uh, lower housing rates, because you know there's a neighboring community that is underserved, um, it just it's, it makes sense to inject this money into those communities because that will in turn uh, assist those communities, increase community retention, and overall uh, improve everybody's well-being at the end of the day. And so, uh, you know, if, if you if people get caught up on the word reparations and look at it from a business perspective, it, it makes it's it's a good business deal to make the move to create the board that looks at overseeing this, this money and making sure that's spent in the community in a right way. Yeah, I'll jump in on this. Uh, I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussions about the word reparations, and I would encourage people to look at what the resolution does, and that is creates a, a, a community, a committee of nine individuals who can oh, advise Rick. the county board on how to appropriate the dollars. Our state legislator, at the end of the day, uh, puts the responsibility of the county board to appropriate those, appropriate those dollars. Nobody else can spend that money except for the county board. So the advisory committee, you know, creating this tells us how they'd like to spend that money, but we would have to agree with that, or it has to go back to that committee for a different vote. So I want to read to you the definition of reparations, which is the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wronged. So in, in the spirit of this resolution, yes, one could say that this is, you know, reparations. But just like if I slash your tires and I have to go get you new tires, that is reparations for the damage done to your tires. 
The confusion comes in that there is a House bill uh, for the federal government, House Bill H.R. 40, which is a reparations bill, and that is a check cut to those who have been affected by slavery. Uh, I think that's when people hear the word reparations, they think, oh, okay, we're cutting checks to people. Um, at the end of the day, we're asking the committee to bring to us an idea, and that idea is only limited by the nine individuals who make up that board, or if they're dictating the state dollars, what what requirements are on those dollars. But the county dollars are unlimited at this point. So if the board was to come forward and said, we want to cut a check for every black individual, it's about 8,400 people who live in Will County, um, then the county board would have to approve that. Um, so I'm not, I don't think that's going to happen just by the money alone, it doesn't make sense. Also, in the resolution, it talks about how no amount of money can undo the damage that has been done through slavery. But slavery aside, there were plenty of things that we did right here in this state, from the Black Codes to the Jim Crow era to kicking people out or arresting them if they spent longer than 12 days in the state, to redlining, to the war on drugs, and a number of other things. Police brutality we're seeing today, um, and the list goes on and on. So at what point do we say our policies have wronged a community and we would like to repair some of those wrongs? We can never uh, make up for it. But we can at it. least start to create some type of equality between economic populace, really. Making sure we have good paying jobs. Making sure we have equality in our homes, in our communities. Make sure lighting is uniform across the board. Roadways are uniform across the board. The fact that we have access to good colleges and high schools and elementary schools are equality across the board. These are things that are not new ideas. We've been fighting this from before the civil rights movement to the civil war. Um, but at some point, we take the next step. And this is us taking the next step. These dollars are not coming out of anyone's pockets other than those who are choosing to, to buy and purchase cannabis in the state. So they're not coming from your property do tax dollars. They're not coming from your income tax dollars. They're not even coming from your federal tax dollars. These are chosen dollars spent when someone buys cannabis, and then those dollars can come to our county and be used in a way dictated by this, community, this committee if this resolution passes. So it allows us a unique opportunity where no one is going to be missing out. So all of the other responsibilities of government to create good, equitable schools, to create good, equitable jobs, to create good roadways are still there. What we're saying is how about we give a boost to areas that have not been given those uh, uh, responsibilities or those opportunities in the past when they should have been. So I hope we keep that in mind when we hear the word reparations, that we take it away from the wording and put it towards the context of what we would like to see. I personally would like to see a government that works for everyone. And I think that this is the way that we can make sure that we've undone some of that harm, not all of it, some of it by closing that wealth gap and providing opportunities where they should have been provided all along. Rachel, we got a question for you from Rex again. Uh, Rachel, do you feel the results of the election of, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, do you feel the results of the election of many Democrats to the board is beneficial to the cause, uh, so to speak? I actually think it has no effect. I think that the people who are in these seats today will have to make their decision based on the constituents who live in their districts, on their own moral compass, and the pressure that is put on them um, from their community. I don't think the wider election had any results on this re re uh, this resolution. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Do we have are there any other questions anyone you might have, the community might have? Please do not hesitate. And, and do remember, if you are not comfortable you know, asking a question uh, in public, we will provide that email. Um, so you can ask any question uh, via the email address. Um, again, to reiterate, this video is being recorded. It will be available at a later date. Um, in the meantime, once this is done, we will follow up with an email. Everybody that's been, uh, that has participated or just registered with us, you will have, get a copy of this presentation, as well as access to uh, the, the resolution uh, as it stands. All right. Seeing that I don't see any more questions, and I hope we answer everybody's question uh, to the best of our ability. I, uh, Yep, and then Nicole, thank you, Nicole. So uh, we do have the, she did put the uh, email in the chat. So again, if you guys have any questions, oh, I think I'll uh, Rex, let's see, uh, Joe Biden supports, oh, okay, here you go. Joe Biden supports, or Joe Biden does support a national 
legalization of cannabis. Any comment on that? Yeah, it's no secret that I recently ran for Congress and that I am support of legalizing cannabis, more so decriminalizing it and making sure that those dollars do go into uh, repairing some of that damage, both in expunging those records, uh, making sure that we have restorative justice for those who have been wronged, and a somehow integrating them back into the community, whether it's through uh, house programs or work programs or some other traditional uh, transitional methods. I would hope that Joe Biden's program is as extensive as one that I would foresee, um, and but I guess we have yet to see how he will act on that. Yeah, and if I can, uh, you know, if I can piggyback on that, you know, I think it's time we, we, we have that serious conversation on national legalization. We see that the war on drugs is very uh, problematic for a lot of communities, uh, specifically those of color. Over-policing cannabis is still a problem, even in legal states, so I think it's time that we um, seriously, when we talk about defunding, right, I think this is what we talk about. We're not, we're not saying defund, we're talking about reinvesting those funds in a different direction that are, that are going to give uh, impact to communities an opportunity to do better, to be better. Um, and I think this is one of those conversations that the national legalization is a step in the right direction. Any last questions before we close out? All right. Well, seeing that there are none, I want to take a second to thank Shawnee Williams. She is amazing, and she's been in the cannabis industry for quite some time, so she is a wealth of information. I also want to thank Rachel Ventura, um, you know, board member on the Will County Board, um, for pushing, pushing this resolution. Um, she's been a, a great ally and, and, and a big help in making sure that this is visible um, and in really helping us with this experiment. Um, I also want to thank Nicole Laporte. Um, I also want to thank Alonzo Wahid uh, with Equity Transformation for putting this together. Again, this will be, all this information will be made available to everybody that's on the call. Uh, we did uh, post an email, so if anybody has any questions or concerns, please feel, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. So thank you so much, everybody, for being on the call with us. We hope that we gave you, you were able to walk away through with uh, immense uh, information um, and knowledge and help us get this done because we're really going to need to get a community effort. It's going to take a village. So thank you guys, and please enjoy the rest of your night.